Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. From the founder of Innovent, whose technology enables wineries to operate at maximum efficiency, to today's guest, Dr. Hobie Wedler, who helps brands think beyond the visual to embrace all the senses. Today's episode, it's sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy, one that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal client. Hobie, in short, if you're a business looking to retain a winery as a client, Barrels Ahead will figure out a plan to make that happen. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. Now, before I introduce today's guest, I want to give a big thank you to Shanna Bull. On last week's show, Shanna and I discussed three of the biggest mistakes wineries and brands in general make in their social media strategy. If you want to avoid these pitfalls, go back and give that show a listen. I am super excited to talk with today's guest, Dr. Hobie Wedler. Hobie Wedler is a chemist and entrepreneur who's been completely blind since birth. After earning his PhD in organic chemistry, Hobie made a business out of his love for wine, his highly trained palate, and his desire to bring sensory literacy to the world. Hobie is now the co-founder and CEO of Hobies, a product and service company that specializes in accelerating happiness through perception, appreciation, and ultimately success. Welcome to the show, Hobie. Drew, it's an absolute honor to be here with you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm stoked to have you on the show. Oh, this is so much fun. You know, I love what you're doing at Barrels Ahead. I love, I love the the strategy piece that you guys that you guys bring to the table. Like it's just, you know, like minds, man. And and I think we're we're kindred kindred spirits and uh, in in the industry. And the fact that we uh, we met a couple of weeks ago is just been amazing. And I'm I'm so thrilled to. Uh, to be able to chat with you and to uh, thank you for for introducing me to your your audience. This is awesome. Oh, it's awesome. So tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, you know, I I very simply put, um, I, I I love. Um, I, I've always had the heart of a teacher. You know, I and I'm not saying that like you know, some teachers, some people like to teach because they just want to know more than everybody else, right? That is absolutely not the way that I think or the way that I teach. I I want I just want to get people excited about things that maybe they they didn't know they were excited about before, and they can really get behind and get get excited about and get invigorated by. So that's that's a lot of what I what I love to do in the in in my work, and that's sort of driven a lot of my my professional and personal decisions as I as I've gone through life. You know, I was born totally blind, and um, my parents. I think we're a little quite nervous about having a blind child for about 12 hours before they said, Oh, no, let's just step up to the game and step up to the plate and figure out how to do this. There's actually a funny story there. Um, My mom's best friend from college is a woman by the name of Barb Morgan. And my mom thought after I was born 12 hours or so after I was born, she said, Oh, I should call Barb. And, you know, we should, we should tell, tell her about, tell, tell her and her husband, Steve about, about Hobie and, you know, that he was born, but he's blind. So her husband, Steve, answered the phone and, and, and all Barb heard was, oh, no, oh, gosh, how are we going to deal with that? You know, and being the, being the person always curious she is, she grabbed the phone from him and said, what's happening? You know, what, what tell me what's going on? She knew that my parents had called and, and my parents got on the phone and said, yeah, Hobie was born, but you know, he's, he's born blind and we think he's probably going to be blind for the rest of his life. And Barb's response immediately was, oh. Thank goodness. You know, I thought he was dead. Blind, we can deal with. <laughs> so I'm going to write a book sometime. And maybe maybe I'll call it, it's better to be blind than dead. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but what's funny about that is that, and, and the truth there is that she, Barb, her father was best friends with a blind man and a very successful blind man. And he was over at their house all the time. So she grew up with blindness and realized that, hey, this is a person who is just an amazing person who happens to be blind. So blindness to her was not a characteristic that, that defined someone. And, and that's exactly how it is with me. And that's what my parents were very quickly able to embrace. Is that okay, this is not Hobie, our blind son. This is our son, Hobie, who happens to be blind. And there's a big difference there. 
And, you know, that, that really shaped me and my, my upbringing all along is, is this idea of, you know, Hey, we are all our own people. And, you know, my parents had super high expectations for both me and my sighted brother, who's two years older. The biggest thing that they did is they told us, listen, this is your life and you need to take responsibility for yourselves and your actions. You know, and if you, if you succeed at something and thrive, you're just, that, that's awesome. You, it's yours to celebrate. Mm-hmm. And if you mess up, it's yours. You're, you're there to take the blame. And, and that's something that's just been so stuck with me for all, all of my professional journey thus far. It's like, we need to take challenges and accept them and face them. And it feels so good when we succeed, you know, it feels so good when we overcome the obstacles in our path and, and just, you know, do, do as well as we can. And it's also important not to be afraid to fail. You know, we, we got to fall down a little bit because you know, failure isn't anything, anything more than a performance issue. Right. And we have to tweak and tune up our performance all the time. You know, it's just part of living. It's part of the life that we, that we lead. So that's, that's really the, the goal of it. And the, and the fun of it is, is, um, you know, it's figuring this stuff out and, uh, and making it all, making it all come to life in, in the best way possible. I, uh, like many people had a, had a high school instructor who was amazing and that happened to be a chemistry teacher. And I think it really is. It, that's another thing that I like about teaching is that you can inspire people and shape their, their line of thinking. And that's, that's exactly what happened with this, with this high school teacher. You know, she kind of thought, man, how's a blind guy going to study chemistry? And I, I was one of the only ones in the class that wanted to take it further than in her class. And I would, I would ask her, you know, come on, let's figure out how to do this. And she'd say, oh, this is just not practical for you. You know, you, there's, the risk is high in the laboratory. And I thought, okay, there's got to be a way to explain to her that I can study chemistry just the same as anyone else. And, you know, with some assistance. And I realized, okay, here's what we need to say. Nobody can see atoms. You know, that's really what it is. Sure, we use our eyesight to detect certain things that are happening in, in reactions. Maybe maybe the color change occurs. Maybe we see a gas being evolved, you know, whatever the case may be. But the truth be told, chemistry is a cerebral science. And from that point on, she became a, a total ally of mine and oh, just a, an extreme supporter. And and that's, you know, I went on to get my, my undergrad degree in chemistry at a University of California, Davis. Uh, knew that I, I was a nerd and I wanted to teach and, um, you know, I wanted to teach at the university level, but I didn't know that I was necessarily going to be able to get through graduate school in chemistry as a blind guy. So I actually also got a degree in U.S. history, which I which I love. I'm, mm. I'm kind of a history buff, a history nerd myself, and it was applying to graduate programs in history when I met my, who would become my graduate advisor as a computational chemist, just an amazing man named Dean Tantillo. So I ultimately worked with him and his in his group uh, and, and earned my PhD in 2016. But the the thing about that was I, I was doing that in order to teach. I didn't really want to get into the research industry. My, my goal mm-hmm. was always to teach chemistry. And you know, I was a guy that wanted to walk into the lecture hall full of you know five or six hundred freshman chemistry students at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning after a long weekend of partying <laughs> and just make chemistry fun, you know. They don't want to be there. They're there because it's a prereq for all the other stuff they think they want to do. If I could get a few of them excited about chemistry, man, that was that was my passion. That the bad boy me. of chemistry. What's that? The bad boy of chemistry. <laughs> I guess so. But if we could make chemistry fun for people and make it exciting, you know that that was my that was my goal is to just to just take that that class full of tired students and excite excite a couple of them to to pursue chemistry further. And what was funny there is that I had the honor of teaching some chemistry classes while I was a graduate student. And what I found is that students, by and large, don't really like to speak chemistry. They like to, and they don't read the book beforehand, quite frankly. So they like to see pretty pictures and animations of how things are happening. And frankly, I was spending the majority of my time making those pictures and making stuff look good rather than you know, actually teaching chemistry. And then I'd have to memorize those, you know, what I had on, on slides and and so that I could present it coherently. And it was just not the, the, the experience that I thought teaching chemistry necessarily could be. So I decided to, to take a career that was much more entrepreneurial um, after, after graduating with my, with my degree and really have been working for myself in the, in the food and beverage industry and, and other industries as well, but largely in food and beverage for the past you know five years now. And I love it. Amazing. 
And by the way, how did you get your start in the food and beverage industry? Oh, that's a great question. And I just want to say before I before I answer that, that oh. to me, being an entrepreneur is not about money or power. You know, so many people hear the word entrepreneur and they think, oh, he's after big businesses and getting rich quick, you know, this sort of thing. It's not that at all. I if I can pay my bills at the end of the month, I'm happy. But I I also I just feel like entrepreneurship is about solving problems. And I think that's what what you and I strive to do in the in the wine and spirits industry and every every move we make is how can we solve problems and make things easier for people, you know? Um, and that's what that's what we're all about here is is coming to the table and finding good solutions. And I've realized that, you know, being being blind in a sighted world, that's what I'm doing all the time. I'm I'm solving problems. I'm figuring out ways to be successful in the world. And shoot, if we can do the same thing in our entrepreneurial journeys, let's let's do it. Why not? You know, Absolutely. so that's that's a big part of it. That's a that's a lot of fun um there and and a big a big part of of what i what i love doing um and to answer your question about how did i get started in the food and bev industry it's a great question i uh i grew up in sonoma county so born and raised in in the town of petaluma and i've actually boomeranged right back into petaluma um after after doing my undergraduate and graduate work out in davis so mm. where i've lived and, and that sort of thing is is really quite you know it Petaluma, Davis, back to Petaluma. Yeah, it's, you're not in the the Nexus. Most, it's not the most exciting of, uh, of, <laughs> oh, wow, you've lived in all these different places. But, you know, I, the way that I got into food and bev was at a very young age, my, I, I didn't realize I was doing this, but I, I was developing my palate, you know, smelling things, tasting things, thinking about flavor and aroma and texture and how flavor comes together to form, um, you know, this language that we, that we speak that, you know, of, of flavor of, of food or, or wine or any, any of these things. And my parents would hire me actually to make large pots of soup for them to freeze and, and, and take to work as lunches and started doing this when I was about eight years old. So I've always been really fascinated by flavor and how things come together to, to form interesting and, and quality, um, quality flavors. And you know, one thing led to another and, and while in college, and, and by the way, living in wine country, my parents drank some wine, uh, not a lot of wine, but, but I was able to, able to taste things and kind of, you know, I always had this love for things that are hyper local right around mm -hmm. me. So, you know, oh my gosh, grapes are basically being grown almost in my backyard and then, and then harvested and turned into wine and sold as a premium good all around the world. Like that was pretty cool. That was exciting. I thought, there's something here in this industry for me. I ended up taking, because, you know, Davis is a, is a big wine school. I took a couple of wine appreciation courses at Davis and a couple of intro to winemaking courses. And it wasn't my focus at all, but I uh, kind of fell in love with it and, and thought, you know, it would be really exciting to get an opportunity in the industry sometime. And actually, right, right at the point that I was finishing my undergraduate work and starting my graduate work, I got a call. Uh, through a friend of a friend, I was introduced to Francis Ford Coppola's wine team. And uh, they, what Francis wanted was for me to co-innovate with him a truly blindfolded wine experience. So wine was really tasted in the dark without the distraction of eyesight. I'd done a little bit of this work in other, other areas. So it was just so inspiring to get into, into wine this way. And yeah. Um, yeah, it was just like, wow, this is, this is incredible. This is so much fun. Um, and, you know, I in innovated this experience for Coppola and I soon went out and was, was because my laptop is my laboratory as a computational chemist and I had an advisor who was really understanding, you know, I was able to travel with their sales team around the country kind of as a wine educator and, uh, and hosting really cool experiences. And we've taken the whole tasting in the dark concept sort of to the next level and, um, you know, are working, that's, that's what we call it. And we're, you know, we've taken it to various food and beverage industries and, and markets throughout the world. And, and we just love it because, you know, we find that when you're not distracted by your eyesight, you're able to experience so much more of a product and, and tell these amazing stories about product when people are actually paying attention again, because they're not fully distracted by, by their lack of eyesight. Um, so I love that. I, I love that line of work and, 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 and that way of thinking. And that's sort of, what has dovetailed me into really working as a flavor strategist and helping people figure out, okay, this is the status quo of the flavor that you're, you know, of, of your product. And, 
you know, is this, what are the elements that you love about it that you want to keep? And then what are the elements that you want to tweak in order for you to totally appreciate your product and be able to be super successful with it? And we, we piece this together with them. So it's like, let's understand your product. That's kind of our perceive. Let's figure out what we love about it and what we can change so that we can totally appreciate it. And then like, like you kind of said at the beginning, once we appreciate something, then we can be successful with it. So that's our little motto. And that's how kind of my little journey in the food and beverage industry in a, in a nutshell. That's amazing. That, that is absolutely amazing. What's some of the, as he went through this tour with, with Coppola and he saw, and, yeah. and you, so many people experience this tasting in the dark. What was that aha moment that they experienced? I mean, there must've been some stories that came out of that. Amazing stories that came out of that. People literally telling me, I never knew I liked wine before, before I did this. I never knew that I, I could, I could really taste and understand the different flavor components of wine. You know, people always talk about it, but now that you've taken away the distraction of my eyesight, I can, I can focus on it. And even like Matt, this is what's so much fun about it. I, I've done these for masters of wine and, and groups of master sommeliers. And people say like the, the most unique wine experience I've done because they, they, they have not ever sat down and had the opportunity just to temporarily remove their eyesight, which is for most people, the dominant sense you know, for a little more than an hour and, and experience something that way. And when we do the experience with olive oil and vinegar or coffee, or you name it, that product sort of takes center stage. So that the real, to be honest with you, the real advantage for, um, for clients and customers is that it, it really shapes things in a, in a unique light for them to understand them. And it, it presents their products in a way that is compelling and highly unique to their, to their customer base. And, you know, one of, one of the takeaways that we got that I thought was so exciting is, hey, I never realized I liked Chardonnay. And mm -hmm. now I, I taste this and I, I love it. And I'm going to start buying Chardonnay now from this company. You know, so it was amazing. There, there's just been you're, you're, you're really kind by saying the distraction of eyesight. And when it comes to wine, it might be the biggest prejudice. In, totally. In, you know, I have a, you see I have the, a label, you that see the color of the wine and you immediately have assumptions. There's a drop down menu that comes up in your head. Okay, this is Pinot colored. I'm gonna get some cherry cola. I'm gonna get some cardamom. You know, I'm gonna get some baking spice. And then, and then all these things come into our mind. Actually, Tim Atkin, who's a master of wine, said the most amazing thing about the experience for him was that he didn't have the drop down menu when he saw a glass of Sauvignon Blanc and knew that it was Sauvignon Blanc. And then this whole drop down of characteristic descriptors comes into your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's too true. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually trademarking a, a phrase right now, which is it's not, it's not what it looks like. And I started at that from the, from the wine industry, you know, okay. You, if I, if I showed you a table with 10 glasses lined up with, you know, whites and reds and rosés and different shades of white wine and different, different, you know, tint levels of red wine and, you know, rosés of all colors and this sort of thing and said, okay, Drew, tell me about these wines, but, but all you can do is look at them. That's all you can do. You might be able to get somewhere, but there's no way you'd be able to tell me about any of the intricacies of those wines. And I think the same thing is true for people, man. I think it's like, we can't judge someone by just what they look like and where we see them. If we really want to not judge, we have to get to know people and talk to them and understand who they are like we would when we're getting to know a wine in a glass, you know? And that's, I think, what, what makes a more inclusive world. Absolutely. That's yeah. A, that's a great point. How, um, so what, so you did that. So we get a little flustered here. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> oh, <it's good. laughs> looking at 12 wines here and, my, and the immediate assumptions that I would have, Right. but you've been working in marketing and helping, um, helping wineries. And you've got a few, few projects out there. The, what's some of the biggest tips right now that you're giving wineries to help people embrace these other four senses and actually use that to forward their brand. <laughs> You know, it's really about think, describing your wine to people in a way that isn't just sort of your typical, oh, blackberry on the nose, you know, cacao on the, on the mid palate finishes with a lot of, you know, really dark fruit, these sorts of, of drop down descriptors that we use really get playful. And that's where I have a really good time with, with the folks that I work with is we, it's not about getting playful. It's about really getting down to business and really understanding the flavor and describing it in ways that 
that other people aren't describing their flavor. You know, I, I wrote notes for a, for a gentleman a few years back, a, a wine producer out of Italy, actually, uh, called Il Vagabondo. And we talked about the, the smell of his white wine, which is a blend of, of white grapes from around Europe, actually, mm. as, you know, the, the, the flinty aroma that you get, like, like kind of petrichor, you, know, you hear that word, oh, yeah. wet, wet earth. But it's like the smell of a dry, sandy beach with some sea grass when a wave just washes up, but it hadn't been moistened for weeks beforehand. You know, it's really getting in there and, and, and describing things in a way that just puts people in a place in their mind. And the other one, I actually represent a, uh, a company based out of Australia called Tucker Creative, which is a wine and spirits uh, branding and creative studio, creative and marketing studio, again, out of Adelaide, Australia. But I'm the sole representative of theirs currently in the United mm -hmm. States market. And, and one of the things that I love doing with them is, is creating brands where the look matches the feel. So the look and feel of the package on the outside matches the flavor that you're going to get on the inside of the package. So uh -huh. really not only like, I think that we can't brand anything until we taste it and we get to know it, you know, and it has a personality behind it. Then we can design the brand based on not the persona of who, who's, you know, what's the ideal person that, that would be described by this brand, but what is this, what is this wine or spirit telling us? You know, what is, who is this? It, you got to get to know whatever it is you're branding. So like, I don't, it doesn't matter how small or big of a, of a producer you are, you know, get to know your product as an individual, as, as a, as a child of yours, because for lack of a better word, that's what it is. You know, and we can, we can get up close and personal and, and really get to know, get to know what it is that, um, you know, that we're talking about and that we're, that, that we're working on. I think another suggestion is, is don't be afraid to, to do things virtually, you know, don't be afraid to, to get out there in the digital world and, and do virtual tastings. It's, it's not necessarily, it's definitely not the same as having people in your tasting room, right, right with you, but it, it does accommodate, you know, it does get people thinking about your product and, and excited about it. But the, the biggest takeaway from, from any marketing conversation that people have with, with me is focus on all the senses make sure the flavor is right and make sure you totally know your flavor and that you're excited about it and that you literally can totally 100% appreciate the product in the bottle because once you appreciate it, it's going to make it that much easier to sell and that much easier to get good scores on from critics. And, and you know, for something like, this is the sort of multi-sensory branding thing again, right? So like for something that I want to just open up by the side of the pool and drink and or, you know, take on a picnic and enjoy with friends, something, something that's just like easy going, easy drinking. There's where I think a screw cap makes perfect sense. Like it, it's a total advantage. Absolutely. But, and I'm not trying to diss screw caps by any means. And that's why I want to say that. But like for, for certain bottles that are like occasion bottles, man, there's just something about the sound of that cork yeah. that is indescribable. And, and like you're saying, you said something super interesting. When a cork comes out of the top of the bottle, you can hear it and you can hear that pop or, or the, the kind of snap that you get when it, when it doesn't really pop out, you know, you can hear whether the cork has been, you know, whether the bottle has been aged properly or not. And I can even, it's really funny for me because like, if I, if I'm sitting in the room with a wine that's being poured, that's corked, I can tell you it's corked. I can smell that. It's just such a, that TCA smell for me is so like, right there and so so refined. so obvious if you know what i mean i i do i've been accused of um i i've got quite a nose for tch and it is yep. one of the it's one of those things that I, even in the compress courts I, I can smell it oh yeah oh yeah and i you know i i smell it it's a funny one because i smell it in nature all the time you know oh, it's really? in forests it's all over and does it smell better in the forest I think it smells like it, it's more meant to be in the forest. Yeah, a little but more of that earthy fungus. Yeah, not. It's definitely not meant to be in wine. But, but you know, for me, it's all about like I just can't reiterate enough how much it's about making wine. And I know a lot of people say this, but it's about making wine an experience that that people remember, that people can live by. And any way that you can, you know, I we're not. I'm not curing cancer, right? That's what my colleagues who went on further with their PhDs in chemistry are doing, you know, they're trying to cure cancer. 
I'm just trying to make life a little more fun. I'm trying to make Tuesday night a celebration, you know? Absolutely. And I love that. And 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 if we can if we can just have this positive attitude and and move forward together attitude, that's the beauty of this industry, you know, especially on the direct to consumer side. It's like how can we not be friends? We have to we have to get along and know each other, you know, and 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 work with each other and collaborate. Absolutely. You've got a new um your new business, Hobies. You got to tell me yeah, about man. that. Hobies. I am so excited. So Hobies is a products and I was able to build a brand around products and services. And it's about bringing, like, like you said in the intro, accelerating happiness by enhancing the moments that matter. So our first product line is actually launching at the end of next month. Um, and it's a line of, uh, of spices and, and seasonings. Uh, mm. Starting out with two SKUs, one is it, what we call Hobie's Essential Seasoning Blend, and that's just your big, delicious, cumin paprika, a um, little bit of salt, a little bit of sweet, onion, garlic, chili powder. It's just really nice for any meat. I put it on grilled vegetables all the time. I add it to chili and you know beans that I'm boiling. It's just, it's essential. You know, it goes in everything. And then the other one is rosemary salt, which is, I'm so ecstatic about rosemary salt because it's this this really cool blend of, um, of salt, of course, but, uh, but rosemary and, and, and other herbs and, and a little bit of lemon, you know, we really get that sourness from the lemon and garlic. And that just, that transforms flavor, man. It lifts, it lifts anything like your roasted potatoes that you typically put salt on, nail it with the rosemary salt and they come to life. Anyway, the point is, I'm not trying to talk about the products. The, the point is the products that this company comes out with now might be seasonings, but anything that the rules are anything food and drink related or anything that makes food and drink better. So I'm, I'm designing a wine glass now that'll be coming out in the next, in the next year or so, year or a few. And uh, you know, I I have a goal of doing a wine brand, you know, a Mm. a Pinot and Chard brand sometime in the next three to five years under Hobie's as well. Um, Got a vodka and gin brand in the works that I'm super excited about that, you know, the brand is built. Now I'm just securing capital for it. We're going to be, we're going to be launching with it, but just ways to, ways to accelerate happiness, you know, and then on the services side, we kind of already described, but it's our, some of our clients are some of our funnest clients are wineries and, and distilleries who just want to understand the flavor of their products better and who want to hand with, but how can we, we know we're doing fine, but how can we make this even better? So it's really sensory and flavor strategy. Um, and I, I don't, not a sensory scientist. I'm a chemist, but I, where I come in is, is as a support and, and someone who can really think outside the box and help strategize on what does this taste like? What, what is causing the flavor to taste this way? And do we like it or do we want to make it even better? And then we, we kind of figure it out that way. But then Hobie's also does all sorts of, you know, any sort of experience in the wine industry, whether it be a corporate tasting in the dark or, you know, uh, marketing or, or, or tasting experiences just in general, like I'm, I'm all about the experience and just making people happy through wine. That's, that's my dream. And, and when I'm doing that and making my, my clients happy, man, that's, it just makes my, makes it's good. It's food for my soul. That's what I like to say. So that's what we do with Hobies. And it's, it's just like, we're, we're here for a certain amount of time, man. Let's, let's make the best of it and let's enjoy it. Absolutely. That's how I, I live. I know you're a big chef. What um, or a big fan in the kitchen. What what have you been cooking lately? Oh man, what have I been cooking? So I've got a really cool recipe that I'm that I'm working out uh, for pulled pork. I uh, just did uh, did one of those for the family for Easter, and I think we've almost nailed it. It's uh, it's going to go up on the website, the Hobie's website, uh, right, right, you know, around the products um, very soon. So we're excited about that. And the other thing I've been working on, Drew. I know this sounds a little weird and nerdy. I've been working on perfecting the perfectly roasted chicken. That to me is like, if you, if you get that right, you know, that is, that is absolutely like such a a, a delicious dish and such comfort food. And I'm going to, you might laugh because my roasted chicken is so simple, but I'm going to tell you how I do it. You ready? I'm ready. I'm I'm taking notes. (laughs) So a good quality chicken, like the flavor of what you produce is, all about the quality of ingredients. So you want to buy a good chicken. Um, I use a lot of Rocky chicken. Uh, Rosie is good. Those are Petaluma brands right around me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mary's is also amazing. 
The first big tip to getting the perfectly roasted chicken is making sure the skin is completely dry. So I literally will open my chicken, you know, the bag that it comes in and then dry it very thoroughly with a paper towel. Let it sit in the refrigerator for about six hours. And I rotate it, you know, kind of midway through. So we get both the back and the breast nice and dry. Mm. The air in your fridge is going to be even drier than the air, the ambient air. So it works really well for, for drying that skin out. And then I literally, and this is how stupid simple it is. I take olive oil, like a, a, be generous here, like a quarter of a cup, you know, or, or as much as you dare and just rub it all over the bird. And then I take my rosemary salt, you know, just, or any, any salt you want. I obviously use, use rosemary salt, rub that and, and a nice amount, you know, like a tablespoon of it or two. So you get a nice coating of that, some fresh cracked black pepper just over the top and you rub all that really massage it into the bird inside and out into a 450 degree oven for an hour and 10 minutes, pull it out, let it rest for 10 minutes. And that is a delicious skin, crispy skin that you just, you know how pork, if you, if you cook pork the right way that has the skin on it, it gets crackly. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what we get with this chicken. And it is such good wine food. Oh my God. Oh man. What would you recommend serving with that? Okay. So that's a really good question. You know, I've been doing a lot of chickens and ducks lately. And I've been drinking a ton of Pinot with, mm. with those. So I'm a big Pinot fan. Um, my good friends, small producer, but dear, dear friends up at Windsor Oaks, uh, do, uh, excuse me, up at, uh, pardon me, up at Dutton Estate, uh, do some really, there in Sebastopol, do some mm. really, really stunning Pinot that we've been, we've been exploring lately. So yeah, I, I don't know, chicken and, and duck and Pinot Noir work really well. That's some great advice. I love a good Pinot Noir. Yeah. What yeah, are, so what are some wines favorites. you've been drinking lately? I have also been on a Pinot Noir um, kick lately. We got a bunch of, we, we, we belong to a few wine clubs up in Oregon and we just got oh. our Beau Frere shipment a couple of oh, weeks yeah. ago. And I've been di- dipping into those a little early. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I, you know, I love what's happening in the Willamette Valley with Pinot. It reminds me a lot of the Pinots of France. Yes, me too. It has, me it, too. it definitely has that burgundy quality that it's, I find it hard for Napa and Sonoma to imitate or not it's imitate, harder. but replicate or be similar to, I think it's just. And what I love similar. about, but what I love about, about Russian river and Sonoma coast Pinots is they're not, they're not attempting to do that. And they're amazing in their own right. Absolutely. You said it. Better. Have you ever had from Oregon? Have you ever had Antica Terra? No, I haven't. Check them out. That's an amazing producer. Antica Terra. I'm writing it down. Yeah, I, I I would butcher it if I tried to spell it, but I'll, I'll send you a link. Oh, thanks. No, that sounds yeah. really good. The other thing I've been really enjoying a lot lately is um t- my Tablas Creek. I really like their um, they're just regular Spree de Tablas. And and Tablas Creek is the name. Yeah, Tablas Creek. They're a Paso Robles producer. They're actually oh, man. They, they were co-owned by Chateau Bocastel from oh, the the French Chateauneuf family. Okay. That what is, I like that, about them is they don't, they're not, a lot of the, the Paso Robles ones, which I love, have like super high alcohol. They keep, yeah. it, they keep it in the tame 14% range. That's amazing. Tablas Creek. I'll, I'll have to check them out. I love, I've been loving Paso wines lately. That is a total up and coming region that I think is, that I would love to work more in. I haven't done much, done much in Paso and I, I'm just eager to, to get out there and, and, and work with some Paso producers because that's, that's really cool. Yeah. They've got another good one that we like is McPrice Myers. Price Myers? McPrice Myers. They McPrice. do a really deep, rich, like unctuous type of Syrah Oof. and Grenache. Yum. Yeah. No, it sounds, it sounds really delicious. I do want to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, just about this concept of sensory literacy and, and, and how we bring it to the wine industry. Sensory literacy for me is literally about being able to take in information from all five senses, think about it in your mind, and then and then make some good sense of it and, and make logical deductions based on that. So, you know, we use our eyesight, this might surprise you, for 85 to 90 percent of the information we obtain from our surroundings. That's crazy. That's 85 to 90 percent of information comes in through one sense which means we have four additional perfectly good senses that we only use to take in 10 to 15% of the world. And I'm like, okay, that's fine, but that's not enough. Like we're not, we're not utilizing our other senses as much as we could be, you know? And as someone who's, who's been blind since birth, like for me, 
it's all about paying attention to the other senses. And, you know, I, I give, I, I have a, this in a talk that I gave that, that people can find online where I, I was standing on a, on a hilltop or on a hillside, you know, big green rolling hillside in Sonoma County in early spring, uh, several years ago with a group of friends. And they were trying to describe the colors to me and, and how it, how it looked. And they were not noticing any of the aroma, which was this beautiful sort of symphony of manure and, and redwood and bay and fresh cut grass and, and the sound of birds chirping in the trees and cows moving off in the distance and just how the foggy air felt. So I was like on sensory overload with no eyesight at all. And all they were describing to me was the, was the visual. And when I described to them, you know, what I sort of understood and took in from that place, they were like, what? That's, how did you, like, we were, we were all busy with the visual. Did, did those things really exist? And it's like, yeah, you know, we, we have to focus on them sometimes. And, and that's what I think I, I like to do in the industry is just apply sensory literacy to properties, to wines themselves, to, you know, any, anything, and, and just really understand them that way and create that, that amazing customer experience that way. So sensory literacy is all about just, just paying attention. And, you know, people use it as a way to, way to calm their minds down too. And I know I do. It's like, just open up the window or go outside better yet and smell the air. Just let your guard down, let your shoulders relax and just experience that, that place where you are when you're driving, you know, just open the windows and smell the air as you, as you move through and just, just get that experience, you know, ingrained in your mind. It's a, it's a very special thing. And, uh, I think that, that when we're literate in all of our senses, this is also about like people relations, right? It allows us to listen to people rather than just hearing them talk. We listen and we pay attention to what they're saying. And I don't know, it just creates, creates a heightened sense of being aware, which I think leads to being more inclusive, you know, of, of people and wine and everything. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah. The, um, it's fun. And it's, so 90, it's hard to believe 90% of is of, for a sighted person is what we take in. And it's only that 10% that we haven't even honed, yeah. but, it, and then that's that power of smell that can just take you back to a place far quicker than sight for me, at least. Like if totally. I smell oh. something or taste something, especially with wine, I can remember four yes. years ago. Yes. And you remember where you were, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny because smell is actually so just a quick, discussion of how these senses work. When you look at something, literally your optic nerve is, you know, your retina is taking it in. And then it has to go through several hundred million neuron bridges to get from your optic nerve to your cerebral cortex for you to process it. And even when it gets there, your brain has to artificially flip the image over. So your brain's actually working really hard subconsciously when you smell or when you look at things. And it takes, it might feel instantaneous, but it takes several milliseconds for your brain to be able to, you know, for your eyes to, for your eyes to see something. And actually what you're doing is you're converting a molecule called trans retinol into cis retinol, which is a higher energy form of it. Your brain is picking up how that's happening, exactly how much and how quickly that reaction is happening. And that's what delivers the visual information. So it's actually a really complicated process when we see, but when we smell things, our little olfactory bulb, which is just above the bridge of your nose, has about 8,000 little nerve endings and they look like little hairs attached to it. And when we smell something, that's basically tapped in, that olfactory bulb is tapped directly into the cerebral cortex of our mind. So smells become much more primitive and also much more telling of what we're experiencing. Yeah, very, it is, it is that direct visceral just yes. experience that we, when you smell. Can you tell me about a wine that you smelled kind of recently that was like, yep, it brought you back? You know, I can, I can. We, we, it was actually a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and it had that minerality. Yes. And that, and even though it was from New Zealand, that minerality just screamed and reminded me of a time when I was in Rioja. I don't know. It, it, it was some white wines in Rioja, but I remember the um, field that I was in and my mind went right back to it, to an aroma I smelled in that field in Rioja. With the Brute, that's, I love that so much because, and, and you were, I'm sure you were able to, like, you could see the field and you could see who was with you and everything. 
Absolutely. And the other thing was I had a sweet wine the other day. And for some reason, sweet wines always smell like a slip inside to me. It's that there's a little bit of like a wet plastic, yeah. or wet swimming pool. And yes. it, re- it immediately brought me back to my childhood being on a slip and slide. Oh my gosh. I love that. That is, that is amazing. I mean, no, I, no winemaker wants to say your wine smells like a slip and slide, but for me, it was a very, it was no, a very pleasant I get it. I totally get it. And, and sometimes that new shower curtain smell is exactly what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's, Oh, I, it, it's so rare that I meet someone who can who can talk about these things and just viscerally remember things that they they experience in wine just just by by being and existing. I, I love that. Yeah, if we can help other people um, actually get that sort of appreciation, I think we might make the world a better place. I think so too, man. I think we can do it. I think we're gonna one one bottle at a time. I think we're gonna change the world. Let's do it. And Drew, I can't wait to work with you, man. I can't wait to to do some projects together. Yeah, no, I, I see a lot of a lot of a lot of ways we can work together. I, I, I yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go. I was just gonna ask you, like, what? I, I'm so curious to get to know this about people. What got you into the industry? Like, what what was it that that made you say, yeah, wine? Was it just life experience? It was. Well, I graduated the degree in philosophy and Attic Greek. And wound sure. up as a stock boy in a wine store waiting to Love go it. get my PhD in philosophy. Love and it. then there were all these books there. And I ended up starting reading them and the, the stories and the history of it. And I started tasting wine, it, you know, and then suddenly that just, it seemed so much more expansive, so much more mm. real and so much more present than everything else that I'd been doing. That yeah. I, I never, I caught the bug and never left. I love it. I just love it. Yeah, man. This is great. Oh, thank you. So Hobie, where, where can people find you? Oh man. Um, my website right now is HobieWedler.com. That's H O B Y W E D L E R.com. Anyone can schedule a, schedule a chat with me, reach out to me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm at Hobie Wedler. I'm also on clubhouse a lot. So if you're into food and beverage on clubhouse, by all means, hit me up. I would love to love to know about you and, and don't be strangers. You know, this is to me, Every part of, of being successful and being happy is about mindset. And I live an abundance mindset. I, nobody's a stranger to me. I want to get to know, I don't care what it is you do. I want to get to know you and talk to you and, and break bread with you and really, really learn from you because there's so much that we all have to learn from each other. And, and back to that, it's not what it looks like thing. You know, I, uh, I just think it's so important to, to, to get to know each other and, and figure out where we, where we mesh and where we jive. That's fantastic. You mentioned you were going to, you were, you wanted, you, you might talk about, about influences in the, like people in the wine industry. Oh that, man, that oh, gosh, thank, thank you. I always like, I'm so big about crap. <laughs> you should have my show notes. Yeah. I always love to talk <laughs> about, um, it, it was that SEO guy earlier. Um, <laughs> No, I always like to talk about gratitude. And um, who are some of the people you admire most right now in the wine industry? I want to mention a couple of people very specifically. So Corey Beck is the CEO of the family Coppola. And back in 2011, when I started you know, working on this tasting in the dark with them, Corey just took me under his wing and he has been the most amazing mentor to me. And he's just such a, such a great person, such a, such a personality in the industry and just just wants the best for people. So Corey Beck is definitely someone I want to I want to give a major shout out to. Thank you, Corey, for everything you've done. And the other person is uh, is a woman by the name of Falana Bouvier, who is uh, w- was big in the uh, in the in the distributor world at uh, at formerly Young's now R and D C, and I think she's uh, she's now just just taking a job in the supplier industry. I don't know what I'm supposed to say about that, so I don't want to I don't want to say too much, but. She just bullied. She's actually a co-founder of a movement called Be the Change, and and she and I had a little article in Forbes online about our our desire and work to to make the wine industry more inclusive. And I, she just she inspires me and motivates me in in all of her amazing work that she does. Um, so I really do I really do care care a lot about her, and uh, I want to give her a shout out too for just working to make the make the wine industry a more inclusive and better place at every every step of the way. So. 
awesome people. And, you know, you asked that question, such a great question, Drew. I could go on, man. This industry is full of amazingly awesome people. It really is. Like yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else we should we need to discuss? Because I think, man, this has been such a great interview. Thank you so much. I love this. Hey, I love this. You know, I'm, I just want to give a shout out to to Jeremy Vice for introducing oh, yeah. us from from uh, from Rise Twenty Five. You know, I'm, I'm going to reach out to him as soon as we're we're done and and just say thank you. But a huge shout out to Jeremy for for bringing bringing us together. And uh, and I know this is just the beginning, Drew. And I want to remind everybody be your best self and be happy doing it. And then life will be good. Thank you so much, Toby. Drew, it's an absolute honor. Thank you. And uh, let's, let's, let's do some work together and make this world a better place. Absolutely. Cheers, man. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.